Thank you for appearing on the Nancy Stevens Show, talking to anyone who is anyone in the arts and entertainment world. And today I'm joined by Radio 2 DJ, TV presenter and podcaster, OJ Board, the most famous man between the hours of two and three, 12 and 3 a.m. Uh, on Radio 2. Welcome, OJ. Well, I hope it's between 12 and 3. If it's just between 2 and 3, listen, I'll take it. But I've been trying to push this whole most famous person in the country between midnight and 3. I don't know if it's working yet, but Nancy, if you'd like to tell me who's more famous than me between the hours of midnight and 3, I'm happy to hear it. No, well, there is nobody more famous, and I love your show. I'm a huge fan. Unfortunately, I'm always awake between 12 and 3, but it's great because I have your show to listen to. But I, I do think, and I would love it, if you would get an earlier slot. I think you deserve it. You're one of the best presenters. No, seriously. Oh, <laughs> you know how to butter up your guests. Well, that's very lovely of you. Very lovely of you, and I appreciate it. It is... Doing a show, I mean, don't get me wrong, I spend a lot of time feeling like I'm jet lagged and having two young kids as well as working nice isn't the easiest, but there is something really public service broadcasting about doing a show between midnight and three, because a lot of the people you talk to are, are um, isolated, they are on their own, they're working, so it's nice to do a show at that time. Well, it's, um, as I say, you know, unfortunately, I'm always awake between 12 and 3. Um, but, it, you know, at the weekends, that's weird because, you know, I'm, I know you're not on at the weekends, but I do miss it because it's, it's almost, it's, it's that, there's, there's listening habits that we've formed over the years. And you've been doing the show, is it three years now? Uh, yeah, I think so. No, no three, I, I, no, two and a half years. Three years, yeah. three years in, um, it'll be three years in May. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been listening since the beginning. But... I know the, the midnight slot is, you know, is, is tough and, you know, so you've got, to, you've got you know, the, the two junior Borgias and, it, you know, you, you do talk about them a lot and I love that. It makes you really human. The, the sort of the face of radio, who, you know, you do, you've got, you know, you've got your podcast, you know, you're a dad and, you know, you've got this, quite frankly, really difficult time slot, but you do it so well. You always sound so awake, even though I'm sure you're probably hanging. Is there a slot, given half a chance, that you would really like? What's your dream slot? Nancy, I'm not answering that. Well, I'm not going to answer that, am I? Of course not. No, that, but anyway, it's, 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 a, it's a great show. What, so tell us about how you got started radio, because I, I believe you had sort of aspirations to be an actor. I did, yeah. Um, the original plan, wow, the original plan. When I was a kid, apparently, according to my mum, she, uh, she said that I wanted to be famous in the week and an ice cream salesman at the weekend. And I did, I always acted, I went to sort of, you know, young drama workshops and I did some all right stuff. I was part of the Glane School of Theatre of Acting. The problem was I hit about, about 13 or 14, I just became really cynical, <laughs> just cynical. Even though I loved acting and I, you know, I went off to university and I did part of an acting degree. Not a particularly brilliant one, but I did one. And I still did bits of acting here or there. I just, I am naturally a cynic and I like commenting on things and I love the disposable element of what radio is. And as soon as I found out about radio, I remember I used to listen to a radio show when I was a kid. It was Mark Keane who did a show on Leicester Sound, as it was at the time, Mercia. And he was just brilliant. And it, I remember listening to him and thinking, I love this guy and I love what he does. And he was my inspiration to become a radio presenter. So I did hospital radio, anywhere I could find, anywhere to do a radio show. I did for a long time. I mean, my, my rise has not been, I mean, if you call it a rise to where I am right now, has not been meteoric at all. I mean, it's been a long, long grind. I mean, I sometimes, when I dare do it, and we all do it sometimes, when I, when I look on forums, radio forums, and people are like, who is this OJ Borge? Where has he come from? And it's like, well, for 20 years, I was doing free radio and small radio shows and very, very local radio and getting sacked or made redundant or paid small amounts of money. So my love of radio has always been there. I think it's the most fabulous medium. I think there are very few mediums where literally in the, in the course of a song, I will have an idea. Mm -hmm. And I will get whoever my producer is the day and we'll get, a, we'll get a bit of audio or we'll think of a way of doing it or we'll literally rehearse it there or then. You just can't do that with TV. You can't be that reactive. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love radio. Just that ability to do something when you're doing it. Yeah, and I completely agree. I mean, there's, you know, I've done both mediums and radio is, for me, my favourite medium. And I, and I love having a podcast. It's fantastic. But the buzz of actually... You know, when the when the go live button goes on, you know the red button. There's nothing like the adrenaline rush that you get with that, is there? No. Well, <laughs> I don't know anymore because we don't really have a red light in the studio. We used to, like the early radio stations, massive big button that said, you know, on air. And then I worked for a while for a power station, and they changed the studio. So when you when you threw the faders, literally the lighting state in the studio all changed. It went went totally to red. 
which was weird. It was like being in a in like a Hitchcock horror film. Um, but no, now it's a tiny little button that just says on air on. In fact, last night I forgot and I'd thrown the fader up and I was singing along to a song. And I was only like, I can hear my voice. Why can I hear my voice on the radio? Oh, that's right, I've left the fader open. So yeah, I know what you're saying, but when you do radio long enough, you sort of don't, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm still excited about doing a radio show, but it, it's not the same. It's not the same, no. it does change. And you, and you drive the desk, do all the techie stuff yourself as well. There's no other kind of radio. If you're not doing it yourself, <laughs> it's not radio. Well, some of us find it more difficult to multitask. Well, well, Nancy, Nancy, the only thing is, though, everyone finds it difficult. Everybody finds it difficult. So you should always do it yourself. Because no, the, I, level of the level of control you will have if you do it yourself is better. The product you will put out is better. If, you, if people say, well, I'm not that technical. Yes, you are. Everyone's technical. You can drive a car. You can, you can drive a radio desk. Literally, it's just air miles. No, I mean I did find when I was when I when I did have my own show on a radio station, they did say we want you to drive the desk, and I thought I was going to vomit with nerves because for me it was. But you would do it. Why? Why didn't you do it? You should no, have done it, Nancy. No, I did. I did, but I well, just found I found myself not as 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 I found interviewing quite unnatural because I was thinking, right, when do I need to press the faders up? You know, bringing songs because in. Because you didn't do it. Because you didn't do it enough. Because I know, you didn't I do know. it. It, be, it becomes second nature. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can, if you've got a good producer, you can make it sound, you can make it sound as good. To somebody listening, they won't know. I mean, my producer are very good. And at time from time, I will be down in London or I'll be somewhere else doing my show, not in my usual studio. And they will have to drive the desk for me. And through a series of hand signals and video links and things like that and Zoom calls, you, you can make it work. But if you are doing it yourself, the ability to punctuate what you do with music and sound effects and, and levels and that ability to ride it is all part of the craft of radio. And I think a lot of people look at radio as just talking or just back announcing or saying a fact that they've read off Wikipedia about, about a band. That is not radio. Radio is everything. Radio is the ability to craft audio and put it out through some speakers. So Nancy, I know, look at you. I know you can. I know how great you are, how intelligent you are, how brilliant and vivacious you are. You could drive a desk. You absolutely could. The reason you can't is you just, Nobody pushed you to do it. And I'm telling you, the next time you get back in a radio studio, do it yourself and keep doing it and doing it and doing it and make those mistakes and don't be put off by the mistakes. Because when you, when you learn to drive your own desk, you are better as a radio presenter. You're more natural and what you produce is a better product. But obviously with the Anyway, podcast... welcome to my TED Talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, my producer's thinking he hasn't got a job. But, you know, as a podcast is different. I mean, how do you find hosting a podcast now? I mean, do you do that all yourself? Can, can, well? I, can I just point out, part of the reason that I had to learn how to, to drive my own desk, and a lot of people who came up through radio at my time, is we didn't have producers. A lot of it was self up. You were put, you know, the, these radio stations that I started on were so small budget, there was no one to drive a desk for you because that was two wages and they couldn't afford it. They could only mm. just about afford to, to pay you. So the choice mm. was learn to drive your desk or not. Anyone who's got a producer is, is given a luxury. So for me at the BBC with like two producers or one in the studio with me is a fabulous luxury. So I think sometimes a lot of people, like my wife was a radio presenter before she moved on to do something else. And she's like me, she had to, to learn to drive the desk. And I just think, Nancy, put yourself in that position. Don't have a producer with you and just do it. You can do it. I think we've got a mutual friend with, with Amy, uh, with Chris Gregg. Chrissy Gregg. I know Chrissy Gregg. He was my boss for a bit. Paid me really badly. Chris is my, Chris is my mentor. Chris is the whole reason I'm in radio. So, such cool. a small world. <laughs> well done, Chris Gregg. Didn't he have a baby recently? Yes. Yeah. I love Chris Gregg. I once went for an all-you-can-eat pizza hut with him. And I, and I think he broke the record for the pizza hut we went to. I've never seen a man consume that amount of pizza. Although he sl I think he cheated by not eating the crusts. All right. Chris can put a huge amount of food away. I can testify to that. Yeah. How but is he? What's he doing now? He's a great guy and a fantastic, a fantastic mentor. And, and yeah, as I say, he was the one who got me started in radio. If, 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 I, if I hadn't met Chris, I wouldn't be talking to you now. So I'm eternally grateful. He gave me a job on the revolution, uh, Oldham and Rochdale. I just left um, a small station in, um, in Coventry and I moved back up to Manchester. Didn't really know what I was doing myself, trying to find some shifts. And he hooked me up and I ended up presenting the breakfast show of the revolution for a bit uh, until they binned me off the revolution. Well, it wasn't his show. It wasn't his. The, the station just wanted to move me on for whatever reason. Um, and they didn't realize I'd actually been given the job working at MTV. I'd, I hadn't told anyone that I'd, I'd got a job working at VH1 at MTV. So when they sat me, they were like, yes, yeah, sorry. And the person who ran the station at the time, I think was, you know, was happy that I was leaving for whatever reason. And I was like, okay, I never told anyone. I was like, all right, 
And then like a week later, I was on MTV. <laughs> See you later. Yeah, boo sucks. I had the last laugh. Well, I had to, there's no such thing as a last laugh no. because everything, everything ends. If you laugh at someone when you leave in one place, you'll definitely see them at some other place when everyone's out of work. That's the nature of the beast when it comes to radio. You sort of have to be fairly humble 90% of the time because you never know, you know. You never know what the future holds. And a lot of the radio stations I work for, especially in commercial radio, they, they networked shows, they co-located, they closed down stations, they cut back. So through a lot of times, sometimes through my own fault, and sometimes not, I've ended up out of work. So whenever you leave somewhere, never laugh at them, never flip these at them, because you never know when you also might need work in the future. So Chris, yeah. don't forget me. Uh, never burn your bridges, exactly. But obviously you've done TV as well. And I, I thought it was quite, um, you, you were on Celebrity Mastermind, uh, talking um, Star Wars as your specialist subject, Chris, as Princess Leia, which, can I ask why? Uh, I had a Princess Leia costume for a fancy dress. I actually had two costumes. I had a Princess Leia and a Wookiee outfit for fancy dress of something completely different. And it just so happened. I was a late call-up to, to Celebrity Mastermind for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not a mastermind. And two, I'm not a celebrity. Uh, and they said, you know, what subject do you want to do? It's like a week away. And I was like, can I do Wayne's World? And they said, no. Uh, and then I asked if I could do um, the books of Terry Pratchett. They said no. Then I asked why, if I could why did do... they say no to those two? Because I guess they didn't have the questions ready. So I said, you know, can I do, can I do Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey? No. So I was like, what can I do? And they said, well, we've got questions on Star Wars. And I thought, you know what? I like Star Wars. Let's go for it. And it just so happened I had those costumes with me. And I went into it and I said as a joke, shall I wear the Princess Leia one? And the producer was like, yeah, if you want, <laughs> wear it. So I had the coral lipstick, I put the wig on, it works. It was... It was while I was sat in the big black chair under the lights, being faced down by um, Thingy, that, uh, that I realized maybe I'd made a terrible decision because I don't wear dresses that often. And there was, really? a camera quite, yeah, there was a camera quite straight on and I was convinced I was gonna show my knickers basic instinct style to the camera as I crossed and uncrossed my hair. <laughs> now, I don't know if that would have got me extra points and I would have done better than third, but you know. So, so you've done, you know, you've done some, you've done some amazing things. What, what's the highlight of your broadcasting career, would you say, thus far? It's a difficult one. That's a difficult question for a few, for a few reasons. The first one is, I completely forget what I've done. Like, literally, you, you could go through and tell me all the stuff that I've done. I'd be like, I did that? And it's not because I've had this, like, amazing career. It's just, I've surfed so many different things over 20 mm -hmm. years. You know, I've never stuck around in one place for long terms of time, just the way that the nature of the beast and the way my, my career has gone. And the majority of people in the media industry never stay anywhere long because things work, things don't work. The people who end up on the same shows for 10 years, 20 years are few and far between. Mm. Um, so I couldn't tell you, thinking about doing the National Lottery draw from outside of the Natural History Museum with, my, uh, with Mylene Class, that was good. Um, broadcasting on Radio 2 is brilliant, um, being part Oh, oh, doing the children. I tell you what I did recently. I was covering Steve's show during Children in Need. And uh, last year, I did it from Children in Need on the Friday. And it was fabulous. Did a really good show. That was a highlight for me. What else have I done? Did a show on BBC America. That was pretty cool. I can't remember. I can't remember half the stuff I've done. It's all been good. In one way or another, it's all been good. Hanging out with yes. Quentin Tarantino. That was cool. You interviewed him? I hung out with him. Oh, tell me more. I can't, I'm afraid. I had to sign an NDA. That's not true at all. I interviewed him for Death Proof, which was his, one of his films that he brought out. And I was working at Nuts TV at the time. And um, uh, we interviewed him at a drag, a drag circuit in Walthamstow. And my team, we weren't driving the car, they just gave us a drag race and came third. Now, have you seen the film Death Proof? You know, it's about cars. Yeah, no, I've, no I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a few Tarantino films, but not that one. Which ones have you seen? I, see, I love Inglourious Bastards, that's my favorite. I thought, I, I, thought it, I thought it was less film. I thought that was a series of theatrical set pieces. It felt more like a stage show that did than an actual film. I suppose, if you're a I suppose if you're a Tarantino fan, then obviously you, you, know, you can have an informed opinion. I've only seen a handful of them. I haven't seen them all, so I couldn't really have an informed opinion. But I, I, you wouldn't think a film about Nazi skull hunters would make good viewing, but it was a gripping and enthralling viewing. It was brilliant. I was, all his films are brilliant. All his films are, uh, films are brilliant. But Death Proof was part of his grindhouse double bill. And um, we went down and my team came third. And as my team came third, basically there was, we ended up getting, giving a bottle of champagne and we were given a trophy. 
a trophy by uh, Quentin Tarantino, who was there. And he, I actually got my bottle of champagne and sprayed him with it. And there's this great photo of Quentin Tarantino sort of hiding from the spray and I'm holding the bottle like that. And it made the papers the next day, made the Metro the next day, of which they had, um, they had cropped the shot just of my thumb on the bottle and got rid of all of me spraying him, which I was very upset about at the time. Um, but that night we went to like an after party in, in the center of London. As I turned up, I saw his PA and she went, oh, Quentin's waiting for you upstairs because I'd come third and I'd met him. I was like, okay then. And I'd actually gone with my dad. My dad had come with me to this, to this after party. And I, get, I got upstairs and there was, he was sort of stood in this little VIP area with some famous people drinking champagne. And then there was like a rope and it was like four or five deep with people beyond this rope, you know, sort of people who were just sort of looking and staring and wanting to get in. And I was like, I, you know, I can't, you know, I'd love to, but I can't get in. And he saw me and he got his bouncer to move everyone out of the way. So I wow. sort of walked in and I was like, oh my God, this is freaking me out a bit. And he just talked at me and I could not, and I was so awestruck and starstruck that I couldn't, and he was talking so deeply about films. I know, I know films to an extent, but not to the level he does. Uh, and in the end, my dad couldn't get in. So I was like, look, I've got to go, that's my dad. Um, so I left and that was, that was my hanging out with Quentin Tarantino, but it was fun. What an, what an amazing showbiz anecdote that is though. <laughs> One of my very few showbiz anecdotes, let me tell you. I think, I think that's why you're so popular. So you're so unshowbiz and so self-deprecating, you know, that's, that, that's just that's... for you though. I mean, I mean, literally when we finish, I'm going to put on my robe again, my crown that I walk around the house in and start shouting at people, shouting about the, my fact that my milk delivery was late. I'm very showbiz. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like a male Mariah Carey. You're so not, we both know that's not true. Cause we, you know, we, and that's what, again, part of your show is, 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 you know, we hear a litany of what's gone on in your day with the junior Borgias and, and, you know, it's just, it's so real. That's why I think people love listening to you because it, it feels like we're in your living room listening to you having just a conversation. And I think that's a sign of being such a brilliant natural broadcaster. That's air miles. That's literally just, the, the hardest thing you can ever do on TV or radio is be yourself. That's the thing that takes the time. Absolutely, that's the thing that takes the time. That you have to, you have to just keep doing it and 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 doing it until you're not thinking about throwing the phasers, that you're not thinking about talking. Commercial radio is very much full of making sure you say the right amount of the words, word economy, how you do things, how can you do things quicker, which has a point to it. No one likes rambling on the radio. I mean, that's the thing that blew my mind when podcasts came out is you had this big wide open space just to talk. You know, you filled because it was endless airtime. You just had all this space just to talk and talk and talk. When my natural inclination, would you believe, is to do things as quick, do things as quickly as possible. It's how I was trained to do radio. And, um, uh, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, talking so in, in, for links, you know, you, you know, when's your next link and it's yeah, four minutes and there's music and, yeah, it doesn't be, it doesn't, it, it's, it's very hard to, as you say, have a natural conversation. I find that really difficult when I started doing podcasts, you know, was, as you say, in radio, commercial radio, you're taught to, to talk for four minutes and music four minutes and it's, and it becomes quite stilted. And then as you say, on a podcast, you've got create creative license, carte blanche, do what the hell you like. And it's a bit, Oh God, I can ramble. Do I really want to ramble? Yeah. And people ramble. And I, I think one of the problems with podcasts is a lack of structure. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I think if you want to ramble on your podcast, that's absolutely fine. I think it's absolutely fine. But I, I, you know, I look sometimes at the podcast lens of people who say, oh, why don't you check this out? And I look at it and think, I do not have an hour and 20 in my life to invest in this. No. I absolutely don't. And, I, and, I, and I, my personal way of coming to podcasts is it's a radio show which is just downloadable. It's, yeah. you know, I think you can take some of the breaks off and you can change things slightly. But I think a level of discipline and a level of format is important. I, yeah, I, I yeah. always have. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, if there was a, a chance and a space, and I have done sort of rambly things, and I'll do it, but it's not my natural inclination. Mm. No, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And obviously, cycling is your 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 great passion. I mean, how, presumably, you find enough to talk about cycling every single week to do your podcast. The cycling podcast. Mm. Well, I don't really. Well, it depends which cycling podcast we're talking about here, Nancy. Come on, hit well, me with your background. Well, you've got the uh, Good Time Sports Club, isn't that cycling focused? No, Nancy, you've not listened to my podcast, have you? You've just looked. Well, this at is it. why I asked for, for a bio that you said you didn't. Nancy, have. as an inter as an interview, you should be able to do enough research. Have, have you listened to the Good Time? Have you Have you listened to the Good Time Sports Club? I have not. 
Well, there you go. So realistically, why would you need a bio if you'd have just listened to it? No, that's just, that's just a sports podcast. Okay. It's not a cycling one. Okay. But you love cycling. It's important to you, isn't I it? But I do do a cycling podcast, Nancy. It's just not called the Good Time Sports Club. I do one okay. called La Course en Tête for Peloton oh. magazine in America. Okay. And how often is that? That is, we do them in blocks of four around the Grand Tours. So um, it's, that's not about cycling. That's not about, um, uh, that's not just about me cycling. That is about the sport of cycling. Yes, so it's yeah. what's happened in the Giro d'Italia. It's what happened in the Tour de France. Okay. And, and, who's, and your, your producer obviously structures your show. Who, who's come up with kind of Midnight Mastermind and let's get, um, did you come up with that idea? That's brilliant. I come up with all my ideas, yeah, yeah. The majority, the one thing I've always been good at is coming up with ideas. My problem has always been sticking with the ideas that I've come up with or putting them, sometimes they can be a bit random and a bit too not working on the radio. But yeah, Midnight Mastermind's mine. I love that. And Shift Faced as well. I love that. That's not mine. That's that not isn't mine. That no, that is, Sarah, that is Sarah. That is Sarah, Sarah Cox, yeah. So when she did the show before me, she had the feature called Shift Faced. And I always thought, I was like, and I said to her at the time, I was like, that is the best feature on radio. The best yeah. feature on radio. It's absolutely brilliant. It worked, it worked perfectly in the slot. It's such a brilliant way of bringing everyone together. And it's just a clever name. It's such a clever name. It's rated. Sarah and her producer, Louise, were just absolutely geniuses. And it, and it came to them. She told me the story of how it came to them. They were literally walking into the studio and they were talking about doing something to get people on. She was going, oh, people on Shift. Oh, yeah, Shift Faces. And I just thought... It was a genius idea. And I, every now and again, I reference the fact that she gave it me. So that ge the genius of that is not me. She gave it to me when she went to, to do drive time on Radio 2 because they wouldn't let her take it with her. Otherwise, she'd still be doing it because it's that good an idea. She's brilliant, isn't she? I mean, Radio, I think Radio 2 is, in my opinion, in the best shape it's been in a long time, actually, with the lineup. Mm. What is so good about Radio 2, then? Um, I love Radio 2 because there's, there's something for everybody. I could listen, I can, I can, I mean, I know the format from, from Vanessa right up to you and everything in between. And there's something for everybody. I like the music mix. I like the fact that the, the presenters are all re really well informed. I like the fact that um, it just feels, it, I, it's so in my, it's, Radio 2 is in my DNA. I've been listening to Radio 2 since I was probably too young to be listening to Radio 2. You know, I stopped listening to commercial radio a very, very long time ago. And Radio 2 just suits me. I just think it's, it's, it's so, um, it's just something for everybody. And, you know, whether you're into politics, you've got Jeremy Vine, or you like Steve Wright in the afternoon, or you like Popmaster, there is something for everybody. So I, people always say, oh, I don't like Radio 2. That's absolute rubbish. How can you say that? Because there's something for everybody. I think it's an amazing station. And I mean, that, that would literally be my dream job to get on Radio 2. I just think it's fantastic. Oh, that's why you're interviewing me. Is that why? No, it's not. I just, I just think that the variety is, is fantastic. I really do. Yeah. And, I say, so, and, I, and I love, you know, I love Zoe's show. Yeah, again, when, you know, when Chris, when, when Chris took over from Terry, I thought, oh God, how's this going to work? You know, Terry was such a legend. And then Chris made it his own, and he did such an incredible job. I became such a fan. I read his autobiographies. I thought he's he's he is a legend in broadcasting. And then when oh, Zoe God, took over, pardon? Absolutely, absolute yeah. legend. And then when Zoe took over, it was just it was wonderful to see. I mean, I've watched her on uh, It Takes Two when she does Strictly, and she's got such warmth about her. And I, she she's just she's she's that positive ray of light that you need to wake you up in the morning. She's amazing, and I love Sarah. I love Joe. I interviewed I interviewed Joe last year at the Amtel Festival. She was doing a DJ set. I don't know why I'm doing the DJ thing, but anyway, she was doing a set and yeah. So down to earth. Again, you're a real legend in broadcasting. I think everybody who's doing what they're doing has honed their craft so beautifully um, that everybody everybody who's doing what they're doing is so good at what they do. I can't imagine anybody else doing it. Exactly. I, I you know, everyone who gets to radio two tends to be top of the game. Sometimes people end up on Radio 2 who are not at the top of their game or at the top of their game in another field. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes shows that, that they have not done a lot of radio. But I think the radio, the producer at Radio 2 are so good that even in those situations, they can turn someone into a good radio presenter. But again, I think at those times, you can hear people who don't drive their own desk, just to go back to the, the earlier <laughs> point. I think the thing is, when somebody drives their own desk, it means they've done lots of radio. Okay, okay, thank you for that. You got, <laughs> I, I can like, answer, I'm you. <laughs> you can do it, you can do it. 
don't ever be told you can't do it. It's just buttons and faders. It's all buttons and faders. And I guarantee you, as soon as you put in, as soon as you put in 20 hours, do 20 hours of, of, of throwing the faders, you will be 40% a better, better radio presenter because you'll just be in control of it. You'll be the queen of the airwaves. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. My producer's thinking he still wants a job. So, um, who is Well, he can still produce you. A good, a, good producer, a good producer can still produce you. Of course he can. Of course he can still produce you. That's what he should be doing. He should be producing you. If you wanted someone to tech up, then you need a tech up just to tech up your desk. True. That is true. So who continues to inspire you now every day? Because, you know, you're so, so busy. You've got full schedule. But you're, you sound very fresh every night, even though I know sometimes you're very sleep deprived. Oh, God. So, well, that is, that is three years of drama school right there, because sometimes I am absolutely on my arse dying. Normally by my own fault, I've either not gone to sleep and I've played computer games instead of getting asleep before the show, or I've done a big bike ride, or I've just been stupid, or whatever. There's, there's usually a reason why I'm tired. I mean, I do have enough time to get more sleep. I just, I struggle with sleeping in in the morning. So for me, like I got up this morning at 10.30, isn't bad. That's a good day for me. Like sometimes I get up at 9.30, which is just into sort of six hours of sleep territory. Um, who inspires me? Lots of people, lots of people inspire me, but here's the book when it comes to people who inspire me. I try not to listen or watch anyone who I, who I regard as a broadcasting legend. Or the reason for that is, if I were to listen or watch someone who I think is brilliant, then I end up thinking what I do is not particularly good, and I then start taking on their affectations. I start almost starting to mimic what they do. And I don't want to do that because the, the best thing you can ever be in this industry in broadcasting is be yourself. You know, yeah. you can, you can, the, the only thing that will ever be, you will ever be the best at is being yourself. You will never be the best jock. You'll never be the best broadcast. You'll never be the most intelligent. You'll never be the, the quickest. You'll never be the funniest. You'll never be any of those things because there'll always be someone who will be better than you in one of those regards. The thing that you will always be the best at is being yourself. Mm -hmm. So I have spent 20 years being the best me I can be. Mm -hmm. And if people like, the me, then I'm absolutely quids in. If they don't like the me, then I can change a bit, but realistically, you're always gonna get a crappier product. So the thing is though, I try not to look at other people because I will listen to these great broadcasts, whoever she is, or I'll watch this person on TV, whoever he is, and, and I will think, I wish I was more like them. And it will, it will in some ways, knock my so, ego a bit that I'm not doing what they're doing. Yeah. And then I will start thinking, well, maybe I should do what they're doing. And I become unconfident with what I do. So mm. I, I admire lots of people, but I refuse to interact too much with what they do. That, not, because, not, because, not, not, for, not for anything other than pure, pure respect and admiration for what they do. Mm. That's, that's sage advice for any young broadcasters, as a, 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 you know, I think. Maybe. Be yourself. I mean, be that's yourself. Just, Chris always said to me, whatever, however nervous you are, how, you know, whatever, whatever, however you're feeling or however difficult the interviewer, uh, interviewee is, just be yourself. That's all you can be. And that was the best bit of advice he gave me as well. So, you know, that's, that's really useful. So we can catch your show between 12 and 3 a.m. on Radio 2. Um, and uh, your podcast is, so I'm going to embed that in the bottom of the um the end of the show, the credits. So what's your podcast called so we can catch you on social media as well? Your Instagram, OJ Borge, aren't you? OJ underscore Borge on Instagram, yeah. Come on, Nancy, you know the name of my podcast. Go for it. It is good. Well, no, well, there's Good Time Sports Club and there's the other one in America. The other one, no. Well, the other one's around the world. It's just for an American magazine. It's called La Course on Tet, but it's via Peloton magazine. La Course on Tet podcast, which means the head of the race. Oh, well, it's been so lovely to talk to you. I'm trying not to fangirl too much. Oh, I'm Listen, do you know what's weird is I don't, you know, because I've done this so long and I am fairly down to earth. I mean, sometimes, you know, you I, can be a bit, I can be a bit of a douchebag. Of course I can. We all can be. Um, I, I don't respect what I, not don't respect what I do. I don't realise what I do. And I find it very difficult to take praise. I, I really struggle to take praise. And like people, we get so many lovely messages overnight. People saying, look, my night shift or whatever I do would be so much harder if it wasn't for your show. Mm -hmm. And I... I sometimes brush it off a little bit and I, and I refuse to read the nice messages that come in, which makes me sound um, ungrateful. I'm not ungrateful for the nice messages. I love the nice messages. I think the nice messages are brilliant. I just think there's something about reading your own praise, which is slightly uncouth. I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of that. But it always touches me when people say, look, you get me through the night shift. My night shift is better because you do it. And it's lovely. I just struggle to take it. I struggle to believe people like it as much as they do. But I should do. I should get better at it. And I'm going to get better at it. So Nancy. Thank you. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think, yes, I think, I think 
I think, yeah, except I think it's a very British thing not to accept praise as well. You know, we, we, we brush praise off, you know, and, and also there's an element of thinking where possibly we don't deserve that. But, you know, I, I do mean that. I mean, you know, you, you, I love, I genuinely love your show and I look forward to, and I'm so disappointed on a Friday night when it's not on or the weekends when it's not on. It's just, as I say, it's, it's just such an easy lesson. It's actually amusing. When, and sometimes it's a bit of a bugger, really, because I'm thinking I'm trying to get to sleep all the same things that are making me laugh out loud are getting quite stimulated or you know when you're doing you know when you're sort of interacting with a caller in Canada or whatever I think oh that sounds interesting and then I want to start googling it as well so it, it can you know it's 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 just a great show you're doing a fabulous job well well thank you there you go thank you I'm going to be better at taking the praise thank you Nancy that means a lot thank you so much and that's a pleasure and I say I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm really grateful that you just responded to my Instagram DM and said yes of course I'll be on your humble little podcast yeah. so thank you so I'm always, much. I'm always happy to help I'm not the best at ever replying to everyone um and I can be a little bit flaky at times but no happy to happy to be on so thank you so much for having me. No thank you so thank you for appearing on the next Stephen show OJ Board I say a bit of a Radio 2 legend between the hours of 12 and 3 a.m thank you so much.